We had started the day here with a pretty significant rebound after yesterday's sell-off. Most of the indices were up about a couple percentage points. Right now, uh, everything is pretty much either flat or down. The S&P 500 up about a tenth of a percent right now. The NASDAQ composite, the Russell 2000, deeper in the red. Transport's down about one percent. Let's get a little bit more of a long-term view as to what's going on in the markets and maybe what to prepare for. David Bonson, he's the chief investment officer of the Bonson Group, which has about roughly $2.1 billion in client assets, joining us right now. Uh, David, let, let's start off with Omicron, and really, let's start off with COVID overall. Uh, there was a general sense here that we had at least gotten past the worst of this crisis. Economic activity was picking up, and we were even starting to get hints that there would be normalization of monetary policy. Has anything that you've heard or learned over the last couple of days changed your outlook on that basis? No, not even a little bit. Um, I don't believe that there will be any change in monetary policy as a result of uh, the variant. I don't believe there will be any change in economic output as a result of the variant. And I think that the general economic direction, which does include some uh, good things and includes some headwinds and some uh, challenges as well, but those good things and those challenges are uh, totally separate from this new variant uh, in our estimation. Okay, so let's talk about where therefore continues to outperform or not, David, because I'm interested if you see no change, you still see valuations causing well, interim volatilities we seem to see on a day to day basis at the moment. No, I think that this volatility, um, if it can continue a little bit, might uh, actually get us back to normal levels of volatility. <laughs> um, we are going now, this is our sixth drop of the year, uh, and uh, the other five all lasted about two days. And, and so we're, we're not even looking at a single 6% drawdown, um, when of course the average over time is something over 10% taking place on average every single year. So we've had very, um, below average levels of volatility. And because most people define volatility as downside volatility, um, that's even more so the case. It's been very limited downside. It hasn't been sustained. Uh, I think the valuations are high enough that we deserve a little extra volatility, a little bit of repricing. I'm still not convinced that this is going to be the time we get it, but I'm certainly convinced that it's going to happen. You look to some of the technology names that are not in FANG, and you look at some of the just astronomical performance from those so-called work-from-home-related tech stocks, the Zooms and the Pelotons, um, the, a lot of the social media companies. Some of these things were down 70%, 50%, 40%. It was barely discussed. You look at the, the very well-known ARC strategy, and, and, you know, Kathy's a brilliant money manager, but that, that name is now down 35% from where it was earlier in the year. Those are significant drawdowns, and yet what is absolutely fascinating is a lot of that money appears to me to have gone from one risky tech to another risky tech. It's going back into the quote-unquote safety of FANG, and I'm not totally sure that's sustainable either. There's pretty high valuations there. So we're becoming very boring investors. We're very focused on where the multiples are lower in mm -hmm. terms of relative valuation to historical levels. What about the valuations in bonds with the 10-year back to a 143? Is that sort of giving you an indication of the market's outlook on future growth and future inflation? It most certainly is, and it's been doing that all year. And if I'm being totally macroeconomic for you, it's been doing that for 13 years. That there's been no point since the financial crisis at which the long bond, whether QE was happening or QE was not happening, there's been no point at which the long bond has said we face generational inflationary pressures. I think that we face more concern around stagnant economic movement, more Japanification, is the term that we use with clients a lot. That's a far bigger concern for me. And when I look at a 10-year, even in this immediate flight to safety spike of the last few days, uh, the 150 to 130 doesn't tell us much. But just the fact that even when people are worried about inflation, it stays below 200 basis points, I think speaks to the fact that ultimately there isn't enough confidence in robust trend line economic growth. And that's what we want to see. Do you 
you have enough confidence right now in monetary policy, at least as how it's being communicated by the Fed? The idea here that we do get a taper, that it's potentially accelerated, and that at least based on market pricing, we start to see maybe two to three uh, rate hikes next year. Um, I don't think we're going to see two to three rate hikes next year. I think that they will taper, and whether or not they finish in April or June is just completely immaterial to us. It's immaterial to the economy, but it's also immaterial to the market. The immediate shock yesterday was entirely algorithmic in various short-term trading positions that have to get kind of arbed out. Um, the, why in the world would the market care if they slow down the bond purchases by two or three months? The entire market knows it's coming. The entire market saw it happen after QE 1, 2, and 3, and markets uh, performed robustly after QE 3. And yet, long bond yields still stayed quite low. And I think that's going to be the case here as well. So the the Fed right now is in a, a mindset that they want to communicate heavily, try to control market reaction by telegraphing to markets what they're going to do. But honestly, I don't expect the Fed to surprise markets again in my lifetime. In your, in your lifetime. lifetime. Oh, okay. That's a bold statement. I mean, <laughs> I'm interested, therefore, like, do you therefore have have no risks hedged? Do you sort of, is there any concern? What does take you away from being a boring investor, as you called it? Well, when I say that I don't think the Fed will surprise us, I don't say that entirely bullishly, okay? Because what I mean by that is a sort of 1994 Greenspan level surprise to markets by hiking, and then there was 1998 surprises to markets by cutting. It's been a very long time since anything the Fed did was a shock. And even when people reference the taper tantrum of summer 2013, they forget that they didn't end up doing it. They ended up waiting, and then they delayed the announcement, and the by the time QE3 had tapered off, it was the end of 2014, and, and bond yields stayed very low, and equity prices had rallied hugely in that time period. Um, yeah. My concern with the Fed and what makes me long-term position the way I am is I think there's too much intervention. I think it has limited price discovery, and that leads to malinvestment over time. David Bonson, we thank you, of course, Chief Investment Officer of the Bonson Group. We